I trust that it is well with your soul today as we uh, gather together to worship our great and glorious Heavenly Father. A couple of reminders for you coming up this week. Uh, the prayer meeting is set up for Thursday, 6.30. Uh, we would encourage you to be here. There is a ladies, it's a brand new announcement. Ladies, ladies, I need your attention. There is a brunch scheduled for Saturday, the 23rd. That will be this coming Saturday, 10 o'clock in the morning. Men aren't invited. Sorry, Dayton, we can't come. You could come and help cook if you want. No. Nope. <laughs> we won't mention who the chef will be. <clears throat> um, but 1030, ladies, uh, and that will become a regular type of activity coming in the months ahead. So keep that on, in mind. It will become the thir thir did you go thir thir third Saturday of each month? We are planning on having a ladies' brunch at 10 o'clock. Um, and last week, we had a baptism. And we are uh, presenting to you for membership, Terry Hernkind. Here, Terry, just in case people don't know who you are, wave to us. Terry is one of those people who moves around a lot. She's back to her normal spot back here. The last couple of weeks, you've been over here. Yeah, she is. She's trying to confuse me. Uh, but if you have any questions, uh, see one of the elders and talk with them. Uh, but we'll be voting on that next Sunday. And the following Sunday is a big, big Sunday. That is the Sunday in which we are doing our transition, the installation of Pastor Doug, and then a uh, celebration for Pastor and Carol Ellis. So be aware of that. For those of you who may be involved in the celebration after church, please make sure that you communicate with Pastor Doug on your attendance. And after the, the uh, worship service this morning, food and fellowship during, after the service, not during the service, after the service out here in the foyer. And uh, we would encourage you to spend some time getting together, connecting with people, and spending some time together. And then the lessons from the book of Job will follow there. And uh, this week we're going to talk about uh, four, at least four reasons why suffering exists. And so be aware of that. I believe those are all the major announcements. Let's uh, look at a, a passage of scripture as we prepare our hearts for continued worship. Psalm 63, 1 through 4 says, Oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you, my flesh faints for you, as in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So I have looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory, because your steadfast love is better than life. My lips will praise you, so I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you so much that you are our Heavenly Father as we have that relationship to you through the Lord Jesus Christ, your Son. We thank you for that. We thank you for the salvation that he provides for us. We thank you, Father, that you are a gracious and loving Father. We come before you acknowledging that without you, we can really do nothing. We need your power. We need your wisdom. We need your knowledge. We need your strength as we go day to day. If we attempt to do it on our own, we will fail. And so, Father, we come before you, even this morning as we sang, that you would purge us of the sin that exists in our life, the temptations that draw us away from you and distract us from you and who you really are. We realize that you desire to build a relationship, a loving relationship with each individual. And so we come to you as a corporate body, seeking that we would be knit together in heart and spirit, that we would be focused upon what it is that you desire for this body of believers to do that as we impact our community, that we will be able to spread the gospel message to those around about us. But Father, we realize that the corporate body is only as strong as each of the individuals, and so we pray as individuals that you would search us, that you would know our hearts, that you would reveal to us those areas that would hold us back from doing and accomplishing that we desire to see accomplished. Again, we pray for unity. We pray for this community that we could somehow impact it in such a way that the Lord Jesus Christ might be magnified and lifted up, that people would make decisions for you, and that there would be a revival even here in Gloversville. We thank you, Father, 
that we have that opportunity. We thank you for the missionaries that we are able to support around the world, and we thank you for those who are in closed countries who are courageously sharing the gospel news, and we are seeing results, and we thank you for that. We ask your continued blessing there. But we pray that we would not be focused only outside of our world or outside of our country, but in our country as well. As we see young people, adults, seniors struggling with almost no hope, help us, Father, to provide the hope found in Jesus Christ. We thank you for those that are here this morning and ask your blessing upon them. May our lives each be enriched as a result of our time in worship and song, as we hear the message which you've laid upon your messenger's heart, as we rejoice and fellowship together. May we be encouraged to move forward for you. For those who are not able to be with us for whatever reason, we pray that your presence might be recognized and acknowledged by them, that you would encourage those who are downhearted, that you would restore and, and encourage those who are in poor health, and that you would draw them to yourself and encourage them in the days to come. Father, above all, we want you to be honored and glorified and praised as a result of our time together. May the thoughts of our, of our minds, our hearts, our actions, our words all be pointed to you. We thank you for it and ask your blessing in Christ's name. Amen.
okay, if you'd like uh, to turn to your Bibles, or in your Bibles if you brought them, to 1 John chapter 3. Uh, we will be continuing our study from, oh, about a month ago. Uh, it's been a little while. We had a couple of uh, holidays in between uh, for last month, so I preached on those instead. <coughs> so, uh, 1 John chapter 3, starting in verse 11, is where we will begin. Uh, before we get into today's uh, passage, uh, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Father God, we thank you so much uh, for this time that you've given to us. Father, we ask now that as we read your word, that you would reveal yourself to us, uh, that we would draw close to you during this time, that the words that I speak uh, would be your words, not my own. And Father, we ask that you would just bless us this morning, that we would be blessed in a way that we would want to honor you and glorify you with our lives. Um, and that uh, you would receive all the honor and the glory and the praise. We ask this in Jesus' is holy, his precious, and his glorious name. Amen. Oh, I did. Hey, you forgot. But I forgot to. Uh, so I was going to wave you down. Yeah, see, you remembered. Uh, so quick story. I, I should have started with this, but anyway, quick story. Um, my wife and I have been uh, looking for homes in and around Gloversville. So we looked at Johnstown, Nico, Gloversville, Mayfield. Um, and so we'd like your prayers for uh, the other night. I was looking uh, through a bunch of houses. Uh, I couldn't sleep. I had some heartburn. And so I was up uh, scrolling through some houses, and I came across this beautiful-looking house. I had no idea where it was, but it said it was in Gloversville. And we, need, we needed at least four bedrooms, and we needed two bathrooms. Um, and so I asked the Lord for that specifically. And so I'm l I found this house. It's beautiful. It's a two, it, it wasn't a two-family house. Every house in Gloversville, I feel like, has four more bedrooms as a two-family house. So I was like, Lord, I don't want a two-family. So anyway, uh, we find this house. I'm looking through it. I love it. I'm like, this is beautiful. I'm like, where is it? Uh, it is right next to the church. It's out back. It is 285 North Main Street. We, you could literally throw a rock and hit the house. We went and looked at it. Uh, we put an offer in on it. And uh, currently they accepted, well, they countered and we accepted their counter. So we're looking to buy the house literally next door. Um, well, not next door, but kitty corner, I guess, to us. So uh, I just a would ask for you to pray for Amy and I as we go through that process. Everything's been working out very smoothly, and I s there's got to be a reason uh, for it, which is, uh, you know, God's glory. But I'm also nervous that Satan's going to throw a, a monkey wrench into there, so... Um, I try not to be a pessimist. I'm usually an optimist, but with big things like this, I um, sometimes can be pessimistic. Anyway, so if you just pray for Amy and I as we uh, look to buy the house and then for the move, um, you know, pray for that as well. So uh, I just think that's exciting that the, the Lord, we saw, I saw that house five hours. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. yeah praise be to Jesus. Uh, I saw the house like three or four hours because we've been looking. I saw the house three or four hours, maybe five hours after they listed it online. So like, so God, God kept me up with Harper just so I could find the house. But anyway, so praise, praise the Lord. Not for the Harper. But anyway, all right. So uh, in uh, 1 John chapter 3, uh, John's, one of his repeated themes is loving one another. I mean, it's literally every chapter, it's talking about loving one another. So in verse 11, John writes, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. We should not be like Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. We know that we have passed out of death into life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides, whoever does not love abides in death. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer, and you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. By this we know, love, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for the brothers. But if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? Little children, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. By this we shall know that we are of the truth and reassure our heart before him. For whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart, and he knows everything. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. 
And whatever we ask, we receive from him because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. This is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another, just as he has commanded us. Whoever keeps his commandments abides in him, and God in him. And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. And so we see John reiterating, reiterating the importance of love, especially towards our brothers and sisters in Christ Jesus. And so there's three points I'd like to make, and out of those three, the first one is that there are principles to loving each other. There are things established in the scriptures to show us um, the importance of loving each other and how to love each other. And so the first principle <coughs> um, that is established is that there is uh, that we are charged to love. We are charged by John, by Jesus, by the apostles, to love one another. That is, for, that is why he says uh, in, in verse 11, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. And what is John referring to? Well, he wrote about it in his gospel. Jesus says in, in the gospel of John, chapter 13, Verses 34 and 35, a new command I give you, love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. And so this was rather different. Uh, a lot of times, most of the time, especially in Old Testament, um, you just loved your family and you loved those that you had close relations with. That was it. And so you have this group of disciples that Jesus has collected, right, has called, and, and that are following him, and he says, you need to love one another. You come from different backgrounds. You come from different families. You may all be Jewish, you have that in common, but you're different, right? And that's what Jesus is saying. Later on, John relates that to the church. John sees that the church must, they need to love one another. They are charged to do so. They are commanded to do so by God, by Jesus himself. And there's reasons for that. Um, there's a comparison, though, that, uh, that John makes uh, in verse 12. You see, he says, we should, uh, we should not be like Cain. Uh, it's interesting that he brings up Cain, right? He says, Cain is of the evil one. He's of Satan. He murdered his brother. And why did he murder his brother? Because his own deeds were evil, and his brother's were we're righteous. <clears throat> uh, and so it's, uh, it's interesting that he brings up Cain. You see, Cain murdered Abel in his heart. Before he committed the act, he had already done it in his heart. He knew that's what he wanted to do, and that's what he did. Now you may say, well, Cain, you know, how did he know he wasn't supposed to murder his brother? Right? I mean, Cain's the third person alive. So maybe they didn't write down on the stone tablets yet, you should do this and you shouldn't do that, right? It was written on Cain's heart. It's the same as it's written on all of our hearts, what we should and shouldn't do. Cain knew when he brought the fruit, the crop, uh, to offer before God that it wasn't what God had commanded to be brought. It wasn't what was going to please God. Cain didn't care. Cain did not care about pleasing God. He was just trying to act religiously. Abel brought of the best of his flock. Abel brought what God required to be brought. And it was, it, was, it was something that God honored, clearly, and God did not honor Cain. And because of it, Cain becomes hateful towards his brother. And in that uh, hatred, he commits murder. Satan wants us to hate each other. He wants us to act like Cain, but it starts in our hearts. Do we truly love one another? If we say yes, then that needs to come out in actions, but it starts in our hearts. You know them by their fruits because they'll act upon what's in their mind. That you'll, you will act upon what is in your heart. You will say, you will speak, about what is in your heart. You have no way around it. Cain had hatred, out came hatred. Abel had love, 
for God and out came love for God. In verse 13, uh, we are hated because we are hated by the world who are like Cain. We are hated because we are in Christ. In verse 13, it says, Do not be surprised, brothers, that the world hates you. The world does hate Christ, hates the things of Christ. In John's Gospel, verse 18 of chapter 15, he says, If the world hates you, this is Jesus speaking, If the world hates you, keep in mind that it hated me first. If you belong to the world, it would love you as its own. But as it is, you do not belong to the world. But I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And there's so many people in the church today that are trying to figure out how to appease the people in the world. They're trying to get the world to love them. They can't, nor, nor will they. There is a deep-rooted hatred stemming from our enemies, which is Satan, the world, and our flesh, a deep-rooted hatred for the church, for Christians. Uh, a couple weeks ago, I gave a message on the founding fathers and the establishment of, of Christian beliefs and faiths in uh, our country today. It was founded on Christian principles. There's no way around that. But look at our country now. Look at the Jews uh, in Israel. They live so far from what the Bible teaches. It's astonishing. But they were called by God. The church is called by God. Why is there a falling away? Why do we always move away from the principles of God? Because of the evil desires of our hearts. It starts in our hearts. The church has been converted. Uh, we are converted to love. It's another principle that we must understand. So we are charged to love, and then we are converted by Christ to love. That's why in verse 14 he tells us, We know that we have passed out of death into life. So this world that hates us hates us because we have life. And they only have death. It is a stark comparison. We have life because we love the brothers. Whoever does not love abides in death. And so there's a contrast that John draws here. He outlines it for us. And it's interesting because in verse 10, so about a month ago when I had read verse 10 and we studied that a little bit, verse 10, the same chapter says, by this it is evident who are the children of God. It's evident, you will know. And who are the children of the devil. It is evident, you will know. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God nor is the one who does not love his brother. The absence of love is the evidence of those who are the children of the devil. The presence of love towards one another is the evidence of those who are the children of God. If we say we love each other, then do we act upon those words? Do we truly believe that we love one another? Verse 15, he tells us, John says, everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. It's exactly what I was saying. You've already committed it in your heart, right? When, they, when Jesus is asked about uh, adultery, he says, if you've committed it in your heart, you've already committed adultery. In the flesh, it's the same. It starts in our hearts. Everyone who hates his brother is a murderer. And you know that no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Now you can be saved, you can be a Christian, and still not love because you're spending too much time in the world and in worldly things and focusing on what the world has to offer. And in that, the world creates a hatred for the church and for the people of God. It naturally will because the world hates the church. Your flesh hates the church. The devil hates the church. And so in order to show love towards one another, it starts in our hearts. We need to do work with God on our hearts. We need to do it in his word, through his word, in scriptures. We need to do that in prayer. We need to take time out of our days to spend time talking to God, asking him 
pleading with him, just talking with him. Let us not be like the world who hates their brothers and hates their sisters and only seeking their own selfish gain. Because then John talks about how we are consecrated. We are consecrated to love one another. So this principle John outlines in verse 16. He says, by this we know love. We know it. It's evident. That he laid down his life for us. Who is he? Of course, it is Jesus Christ. And that we ought to lay down our lives for our brothers. See, Christ did not just lay down his life for you to be saved. He did it so he would be glorified. But then he commands us to do something with our salvation. He says, love each other. Why is that the first thing that he wants us to do? Because as a unit, when we are working together with the same mind, the same heart, the same goals, mighty things can happen. And mighty things will happen. But when we are divided then terrible things will happen. Satan will have his way, and we will not look out for what is best for each other. There will be murmurings, uh, and there will be hatred amongst, the, uh, amongst one another that leads to uh, the demoralization of the church. Verse 17, if, every, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need, yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? See, you have been given gifts. And they're not just monetary gifts. They're not just worldly gifts. God has graciously given you gifts. He, uh, he's given me the gift of speaking in public. Uh, and speaking in front of people has never bothered me. That may not be your gift. That's fine. There are gifts. Uh, there are things that God has given to you that he hasn't just given to you for you to use for yourself. He's given those gifts to you so that you would bring him glory and honor. And he commands us to use those gifts first and foremost in the church with love towards each other. If anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need. So if we have things that we can do to provide help for each other, we are supposed to give those things up. We are supposed to naturally want to be giving people because that's what Christ was. That's who Christ was. He gave up everything. He gave up his, his heavenly kingdom, his throne that he was sitting on, to come down to earth, to die on a cross, to live amongst sinners like you and I, so that his Father's name would be glorified and that we would be saved. Then John says in verse 18, little children. He comes back to his phrase. He says, little children. Which is, a, which is a term of endearment, but also a term showing the immature, uh, how immature some of these Christians were. He says, little children, let us, now love in, let us not love in word or talk, but in deed and in truth. Love is not a word. We use it to describe it, but love, when I say to my son, when I say to my wife, when I say to my daughters, I love you, I don't mean it just by, I don't just say it to say it. I also show them that I love them. I spend time with them. I talk with them. Um, even when Zeke was a little guy with like a year old, I would speak to him like this. I wouldn't, I wouldn't baby talk him. I wouldn't, it, whatever. And people, are, people were like, why do you talk to him like he's an adult? Because one day he'll learn. But it's because I love him and I want him to learn how to speak, Right? And so when I tell him I love him, I want him at an early age to understand what that word means. That it's not just a word that I'm saying to him, but that it's an action. And that my actions reflect my words. So John says here, don't just say I love you. Let us not love in word or talk. Let us love in deed and in truth. And we can only love in truth if we know the truth. The truth is revealed to us through the scriptures, through the Bible. And so we can't love in deed and in truth unless we know the Bible, unless we are spending time in the Bible and in prayer, speaking with the truth, right? Is that not what Jesus said? He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except through him. 
So our next point is that there is power. There is principles of love. There is power in love. There is a power of love. In verse 19, John says, By this we shall know that we are of the truth. Remember, again, love and deed and truth. We shall know that we are of the truth and are reassured our heart before him. We can have an assurance. There is a proof of our love for each other. There should be a proof of our love for Christ. In 2 Peter, it's reflected in 2 Peter in Peter's uh, epistle, chapter 1, verse 3 and 4. He says, His divine power has granted to us his church, all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence by which he has granted to, to us his precious and very great promises so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature having escaped from the corruption that is in the world because of sinful desire. We can have this proof, this confidence, because it should be evident that Christ is working in our lives. There's evidence that he's not if we are only concerned with worldly things. There's evidence that it is when we are concerned about the things that God is concerned about. And clearly, God was concerned with the love of his brothers when he was here on earth. He was concerned with the well-being of the people that followed him. He was concerned with the well-being of those that didn't follow him. But he was concerned about people. His divine power has granted us all things pertaining to life and godliness. And that is the Holy Spirit, what he does in our lives. And he's shown us that through his word. We are to be people of the word. There is a proof for us, a truth for us, that should reassure your hearts of your salvation and of the work that God has done in your life. We can become numb sometimes to what God is doing um, because it becomes mundane. It does become work. Um, I remember going down to a, uh, a missions conference and I spoke with a missionary and I was, I was considering becoming a missionary at this time. It's about 10 years ago. And I was saying how awesome it was, must be to be a missionary on the, on the mission field and giving people Jesus. And he said to me, it becomes work. I was so surprised. Like, I was like, don't you want to be like, yeah, go get them, buddy, you know? And he said it becomes work. But I'm glad he did. I'm glad he told me that. Because if he hadn't, I'd, uh, I'd have this perception of ministry always being this amazing high. Uh, and I, I, I know for a fact that Pastor can tell you that with the, those amazing highs are amazing lows. But we know that Christ is with us, that we have a proof of our salvation. Because during those lows... God was with us. During those highs, God was with us. There should be a proof. And it doesn't always have to come out in emotions. There is a power. There is a power in this love. Uh, of Yeah, there's a power in the power of love. Ha, I didn't notice that until now. 1 John 3.20 tells us, For whenever our hearts condemn us, God is greater than our heart. And he knows everything. I love this because in Jeremiah 17, 9 through 10, it says the heart is deceitful above all things. It is desperately sick. The King James renders that as wicked. Who can understand it? I, the Lord, search the heart and test the mind to give every man according to his ways, according to the fruit of his deeds. Jeremiah says that you can't trust your heart. You can't trust your emotions. Because that's what the word here means in the Greek. It's the emotions, the heart, and how easily they're stirred up. How easily they can make us sway one way or another. John says, whenever our heart condemns us, God is greater than our heart. He's greater than our heart because he's the one that owns it. He's the one that's created it. If we believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, then it is him who holds our heart. Our flesh wants to tell us that we can't do anything that God has called us to do. Our flesh wants to tell us that we can't spend the time that God has called us to spend with him. But God is greater than our heart. God is working in us to produce a work for his glory, for his honor. Paul writes in 2 Timothy 
uh, chapter 1, verse 7, For God gave us a spirit, not of fear, but of power and of love and of self-control. This is the heart that God puts in us, but it's a continual work because we always want to revert back to what the flesh calls us, what the flesh tells us we can and can't do. God is greater. Ephesians, Paul writes in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. This power is not a power that you can just muster up, a power that you could just use at a, at a whim. It's the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives, doing a constant work, doing a work on our hearts and our souls and our minds, that we would be able to bring glory and honor to Christ Jesus with our efforts in this life. But we can't do that on our own. It's the work that he's doing in us. So there's a proof, there's a power, and then there's a peace that comes with this. Understanding that if we're doing what God has asked us to do, then we can have peace. We can be at home. We can understand what uh, John writes in verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us. So if there is no condemnation coming from our flesh, coming from our heart, we have confidence before God. We know that we're right. If we understand that God is greater and we are not condemning ourselves, which we shouldn't, there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus as we read in Romans chapter 8, then we can have confidence before God, standing before God, that we are doing what is right. It was funny, there was a, uh, a recent funeral I went to, and it was, a, it was an old-fashioned, jumping out of your seat, yelling uh, funeral. Uh, there was a, gen a pastor had passed away, and so they were holding this, uh, this funeral for him, and it was really good. It was very heartfelt. Uh, but one of the things I found interesting, not interesting, was they were giving the altar call, and the altar call went on for an extended period of time. And uh, it was as if I was being, I felt guilted into going forward, and I'm like, I'm not even doing anything wrong. Like, I don't know, like, why would I go forward? But I wanted to, you know what I mean, just because I was like, I felt like I was being guilted into doing so. But I, I sat there and I asked the Lord, I'm like, should I go, you know, should I go forward? And there is no condemnation in Christ Jesus. This was the verse that he gave to me. And he's like, no, I am still a sinner. I sin every day. I, I lie, I cheat, I steal, so to speak, right? There is, there's hatred in my heart that God is still working out, right? But if we are constantly condemning ourselves, saying that we're not good enough it, and that we can't do it, then we're, we're correct, but it's not us doing it anyway. If Christ has saved us and that we are doing his will, we are actively in his word, we are actively in prayer, and we are actively in fellowship, what condemnation is there for us? There is none. If we're doing his will, then we're right. We're right where we're supposed to be. And so have this confidence that we can go before God saying we're doing what we're supposed to be doing because we're following what you've told us to do. And that's the position I want to be in. If you're not, then yes, confront it. Confront it with God. Confront it with a brother or sister in Christ. And get over those issues and those problems that you have together. You can't do it alone. That's why we love one another. And so that there is a peace, a peace that surpasses all understanding, that comes from the Holy Spirit that abides in us. And through that peace, we understand that there is a promise, a promise from the Holy Spirit. In verse 22 in our passage, John says, And whatever we ask, we receive from him, because we keep his commandments and do what pleases him. So we can have confidence going before God. And then whatever we ask, if we are, if we are right with God, whatever we ask, he'll give to us. And that's interesting, right? Because we read one of the most misunderstood or misquoted verses in the entire Bible in Matthew chapter 7, verse 7. It says, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. So that sounds like I can go have whatever I want. Technically, I can. But I think James outlines what the meaning of this verse is. James says in chapter 4, verse 3 of his epistle, you ask and don't receive. Why do you ask and not receive? Because you ask wrongly. To spend it on your passions. See, our fleshly passions are telling us what it thinks we need. 
what it thinks we want. When we are not spending time with God in his word and in prayer, our passions start to take over. Our flesh starts to take over. And so when we can take a verse like Matthew 7, verse 7, and say, oh, whatever it is, God's going to open it up to me. Whatever I want. James says no. That's not what that verse means. In John's Gospel, he says in chapter 15, verse 7, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, Ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. This is the same John. He wrote it in his epistle. He wrote it in his gospel. It means the same thing. We just take it out of context because we're evil. (laughs) We have evil desires, evil passions. And so we want to say, yes, Lord, I really want that Corvette, and I know you're going to give it to me because I ask for it in your name. And I'm not saying that he wouldn't give you a Corvette. Maybe he would, but I know he wouldn't unless it's for his honor and for his glory. Pastors told me this a a couple times, that there were different desires that he's had throughout his life. Uh, And he went to the mission field expecting never to have those desires fulfilled. But then those desires were fulfilled. Like you always wanted to fly a plane, correct? And then God not only allowed him to get his pilot's license, but somebody went in halves or even more so on a plane with him so he could fly a plane. God knows your desires. He knows your heart. He knows what you want. And if you can bring glory and honor to him by spending time with him in his word, he'll give you some of those fleshly desires that you don't technically need. He loves you. He wants to give you what, what is good and what is righteous. So sometimes he might give you that Corvette to drive around. I don't know. But in that, that's not to be our focus. Our focus isn't to be on what we can obtain here on earth. Our focus has to be on what we can obtain for the kingdom of heaven, for his righteousness, for his glory, not our own. And so there is a a power that we have uh, from love, and we must put that, uh, that power into practice. The final point I would like to make is that there needs to be a practice of love. John says in verse 23, and this is his commandment, that we believe in the name of his son, Jesus Christ, and love one another just as he commanded us. Again, that was repeated from his gospel, John's gospel, where Jesus says, a new command I give to you, love one another. It's something that John was on his heart, was on his mind. It's what the Holy Spirit inspired him to write down, both in his gospel and in his epistles, and even into Revelation not revelations. Uh, and so it's repeated by Peter in, uh, in his epistle, 1 Peter 4, uh, verse 8 and 10, 8 through 10. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly. It is not easy. That's why he says to do it earnestly. Since love covers a multitude of sins, show hospitality to one another without grumbling because that can be very easy to do show hospitality, and then grumble about it. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. Again, the idea of these gifts have been given to you and I, not for you and I just to use on ourselves, but to use towards one another. As good stewards of God's varied grace. I think that phrase is interesting. See, it says that God has, uh, has given to his stewards uh, varied grace. And so the word varied means is that there's different aspects of God's grace. And so there's aspects of God's grace that he's shown to me that he may not have shown to you. Not that he hasn't shown you his grace, which he has, but he's shown different aspects. But those aspects that we've received from his grace, we are to use because those are gifts. The aspects of his grace towards us are gifts that we are to use. And how does Peter say that we're supposed to use them? Towards one another in love in kindness, in hospitality, earnestly. It's not easy to do. See, we must understand that we have an identity. We call it today as Christianity. We are Christians, right? I would identify as a Christian. 
I hear some people say they don't like that term. They say, I'm, I'd rather call myself a Christ follower. Sure, you can call yourself whatever you want. Um, but we must understand that if we believe that we are Christians, if we believe that we are Christ followers, um, that there's an identity that it comes with. In the first half of verse 24, John says, whoever keeps his commandments abides in God and God in him. You are not your own. Galatians 2.20, I have been crucified with Christ. This is Paul. He says, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. This is not my life. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me, who gave himself for me. I want those words to be my words. I love that statement. Let not this life be my life. Let it be yours, Lord. Our Savior said the same thing before he faced the cross. And the last thing that we have is that we need to have confidence in our identity in Christ. There needs to come a confidence. In the second half of verse 24, he says, And by this we know that he abides in us, by the Spirit whom he has given us. The Holy Spirit in our lives is the evidence that we need. And it is the confidence that we need to have built in us through the Holy Spirit to do his will, to act according to his ways. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 4. Such is the confidence that we have through Christ towards God. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves. Not that we are sufficient in ourselves to claim anything as coming from us. We are not sufficient. But our sufficiency is from God who has made us sufficient. What has he made us sufficient for? To be ministers of a new covenant. A covenant of love, which is what John is talking about. Not of the letter, the law. It is not of a new covenant of the law. It is a covenant of the Spirit, of the Holy Spirit. For the letter, the law, kills. But the Spirit, it brings and gives life. Proverbs 3.26, for the Lord will be your confidence and will keep your foot from being caught. Um, there is a, a poem that was written, probably many of you are familiar with it, called Footprints in the Sand. Um, I couldn't help but think of this poem as I was studying this passage this week. So I'd like to read that for you. Footprints in the Sand. The author is unknown. One night I dreamed a dream. As I walked along the beach with my Lord, across the dark sky flashed scenes from my life. For each scene, I noticed two sets of footprints that were in the sand. One belonged to me, one belonged to my Lord. After the last scene of my life had flashed before me, I looked back at all the footprints in the sand, and I noticed something. I noticed that at many times along the path of my life, and especially those times that were, that were the very lowest and the very saddest of times, that there was only one set of footprints in the sand. This really troubled me, so I asked the Lord about it. I said, Lord, you said once, um, and I decided to follow you, you said you'd walk with me all the way. But I noticed that during the saddest and most troublesome times of my life, there was only one set of footprints in the sand. And I said, I don't understand why. When I needed you the most, you would leave me. And Jesus whispers to me, my precious child, I love you, and I will never leave you. Never, ever. And during especially during your trials and tribulations and your testings. You see, when you saw only one set of footprints, it was then that I carried you. God will carry us through our hard times, our troublesome times. It is his work in our lives that we are supposed to be looking to accomplish. It is not for us to decide the gifts that he gives to us. It's not for us to decide how our lives are to end up. When we give it to him, I know my life will end up with him in eternity. That is my hope. That is my confidence. That is why I can do what I do the way that I do it, because God is carrying me through this life. 
And church, believe me when I say persecution is coming. Persecution is coming because there is not a respect, there is not a reverence for our God. And when there is not a respect or a reverence for our Lord, Satan has his ways and death reigns. We need to be people of the book. Paul writes in Romans, I'll finish with this, chapter 12, verse 9 and 10. Love must be sincere. We must hate what is evil. We must cling to what is good. Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for this passage that we received from John. Thank you for inspiring him to write the words that he wrote through the power of your Holy Spirit. Father, help us to be a church that shows love towards one another, that shows a love that confuses the world, that they cannot understand because they, not, they are not of you. Help us not to adhere to the things in this world and of this world, but adhere to the things of your word, of who you are, of your character, of your power, of your might. We ask that we would bring honor and glory to your name and to your name alone, that the only pride that we would find would be in this name of your son, Jesus Christ, that we would be humbled enough, Father God, to serve you with every uh, waking hour that we have. Father, draw us away from temptations and draw us into your book, draw us into prayer. We ask that you would just go before us, send your Holy Spirit, Father God, into our lives. Help your words to be on the tip of our tongues, on the forefront of our minds, that we would naturally and want to speak your word, the truth, the life. Father, we love you. We ask that you would continue to do such a mighty work in Emmanuel Baptist Church and in Gloversville, New York. I pray that you would uh, do that work in the communities that we live in, Father God. Send us out, Father God, to be your ambassadors, to be your hands, to be your feet. We love you. I ask that you would bless the remainder of our day. <coughs> I, breath, I ask that you would bless our fellowship, Father God, as we talk about who you are. And we ask this in Jesus' holy, in his precious, and his glorious name, our Lord and Savior. Amen.